Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session. Uh, this talk is about a hard, hardware-supported control flow integrity. Uh, we name it as policy agnostic control flow integrity. This is not a new topic, but it's been a very hot topic recently. So we're trying to tell you more of our research outcome in this area, especially to involve hardware uh, in the whole uh, uh, scenario. So before the, the talk, I would like to introduce myself and uh, uh, the other two uh, speakers. Uh, my name is Ye Ye Jing, and I'm from uh, University of Central Florida. I'm also a researcher in the Cyber Immunity Lab. And the other two speakers, one is Dean Sullivan and the other is Orlando Arias. They're all from University of Central Florida. And you can tell that we wear all the coats we have uh, because in, in, we've been in Florida for too long, we almost forget how to survive in winter. So uh, going through the talk, so this is a, a high level uh, outline of our uh, talk. So we will introduce the motivation and the, the runtime attacks. And also then we will discuss the defense against uh, 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 code reuse attacks. And then our work in hardware design requirement and the core part of the policy agnostic uh, CFI control flow integrity. So before I'm going inside the, uh, wait, why did this not change here? Oh, good. So before we uh, introduce the key technology, key techniques, so we want to discuss the motivation. The motivation, I mean, the, the high level motivation is very simple. We want to protect all the native codes. So one thing we want to discuss first is that we have been for many decades of runtime attack the ARM race. And starting from the 1988, the first internet worm, and then we have the code inject attack, return to liberty attack, and on and on, and then in 2007, they come to the return-oriented programming. It's kind of like open a new arena for the attack and defense. And the multiple defense solutions have been proposed, and they all been bypassed, and then new solutions have been uh, developed. So uh, even though it's been like decades in this area, we still see a lot of very recent examples that people using this uh, return-oriented uh, programming, or, or we call the code reuse attack, uh, to compromise our modern system. And this is the 2013 case, and we have the 2015 case in the Black Hat presentation. And even in this year, the Cisco router exploits, and the, the, uh, the government uh, kind of like trying to target the human rights groups. So as we want to say that, this area is a very interesting area. It's been uh, investigated for so long, but we keep on finding some new uh, weakness in our new defense solution that people can uh, bypass those defense solutions. And uh, so again, an another high level thing, so that we want to see that this, we know that this is a high pack impact. And we also, not just the academic, the, the, the industry also proposed so many solutions. Like these are a, a, a list of their uh, tools provided. But I mean, very sadly that these methods have already been proved either can be bypassed or not sufficient enough. So, so this eventually, as we said, this arm race is a very interesting attacking scenario that we keep on uh, come up with new defense, but new offense method seems even pop up faster. So again, uh, this is we give a very high level summary of what have already been proposed. So people always ask, oh, this is a very hot area. People propose so many solutions. And this is a very high level summary from defense side. We have so many CFI, uh, ROP guard, bind CFI, a bunch of them. The, some of them from academic, some of them from industry. However, for the attack side, we have so many attacks method also being proposed to either bypass or to uh, compromise the whole protection solution. 
So, so after decades of this arm race, we are still seeking practical and a secure solution. And if this is the, 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 I would say the beauty of cybersecurity research topic, that some research topic we may find the fundamental solution, but not on this one. So that's why we keep on come up with a new idea and our research is trying to provide from the hardware perspective, some fundamental solutions. So going further, discuss the word runtime attack would be. So first, it's some like background just for your information. If you already know that, you can skip this slide. So first thing is that we call the uh, code inject attacks. So what's a code inject attack? So we have basic blocks there and uh, the attackers can leverage some of the uh, design flaws, for example, like a uh, buffer overflow. It's, it's a very popular uh, bug. And then the attacker will inject a malicious code there. So then they would change the control flow and uh, to, uh, to point to the uh, malicious injected code so that they can uh, do anything they want to compromise the system. But this has been protected nicely by a very simple solution, the DEP, the uh, data execution prevention. So then come up with a code reuse attack. This time, since the injected code will not be executed, so the attacker will change the control flow and reusing some existing code block there. So in this way, they can uh, build up the functionality. They don't really need to rely on any of the uh, newly injected code, but just reusing the existing code, but just organize them in the malicious way. So this is the official name is we call the return oriented programming. Uh, or it's we call the, the uh, a prominent uh, code reuse attacks. So, and it has been proved to be Turing complete. So this is really like horrifying people because people sometimes argue that since you can only use existing code, maybe you cannot do anything you want. But people have proved that, okay, it's Turing complete. So uh, before going deep of the, uh, uh, the, the, the ROP attack, here is some like basic steps that how you need to perform a ROP attack. And there is some of the uh, uh, terminology that we will use on and on, uh, the uh, return instruction, the uh, basic block, or the instruction sequence chain that we use as gadgets. We combine them together. So again, so what's the threat model here? So what's, what are we really trying to protect here? So in in our work, we first assume that the application is protected by DEP. And the uh, attacker knows the memory layout. It's transparent. But what the attacker can do, first the attack can disclose the readable memory. And then the attacker can manipulate the writable memory. So this is the baseline. This is very like low request to attacks that if the attacker have this capability that we believe that it's a reasonable attack model. And then comes our solution that we want to defend against the uh, code reuse attack. And uh, Dean will pick this up. Okay, so without you know, belaboring the point, um, just for some background information and completeness, uh, there's sort of two defenses against code reuse attacks. Uh, and you can either apply randomization or control flow integrity. Uh, randomization is a great defense uh, because it has really low performance overhead and scales well uh, with complex software like operating systems and browsers. However, um, it's vulnerable to uh, information disclosure and requires a high amount of entropy um, from sort of some brute forcing style attack. Uh, control flow integrity, on the other hand, offers formal security guarantees. Uh, but um, there's some trade-offs associated with the associated analysis to build a control flow integrity policy that requires trade-offs in performance and security. And it's also challenging to integrate in uh, complex software and to cover uh, completely a operating system overall. Um, randomization uh, ultimately is vulnerable to memory leakage. Uh, it's both direct and indirect memory disclosure. 
uh, will allow you to break sort of the most fine-grained ASLR schemes uh, to date. Uh, and this is basically just reading a direct code pointer in a code page or um, leaking a code pointer from a data page, such as a stack or heap. This is trivial to do and has been shown to be trivial to do in uh, JIT style code, like in a browser in your Firefox. Um, and our collaborators have sort of examined that uh, extensively and shown that current uh, randomization defenses or fine grain randomization defenses are actually vulnerable to this. So this is the current state of the art for um, randomization. So we're gonna go ahead and start talking about the requirements, right? Um, so what you have to sort of solve if you wanna build some hardware defense. Um, but before we do that, I just need to sort of get a baseline for everybody on what control flow integrity ultimately is. And it is effectively just restricting control flow to benign and correct targets. Uh, and the intuition is very straightforward. Code reuse attacks divert control flow from benign and direct targets. So presumably, if I have a great CFI policy, I'm going to be able to detect some control flow hijacking. Um, this is, again, a provably correct security mechanism with a powerful attack model uh, in the sense that I have, I allow the attacker access to complete memory uh, and allow him access to write uh, data pages that are writable and to read code pages so he can actually look at or sort of where functions are in the program space. And we, so we sort of don't assume that randomization is in place. Um, it also provides deterministic protection at runtime. So the basics are very straightforward. We have two basic blocks. And what we want to do is from the control flow graph, we want to build a sort of labeling mechanism that determines where to and from these control flow box can redirect control. So in this case, we have this node label A, and we're going to check at exit if it's targeting its uh, intended uh, path. Otherwise, it's going to throw an error if it targets a separate path. Um, of course, the uh, issue is um, that control flow and graph analysis is in general undecidable. So what you do is you typically do what's called a points to analysis, and this is conservative. Um, the, the intuition is that you don't want to in, uh, intentionally under approximate the control flow, uh, the points to analysis, so that you have a more precise pointer um, set. Rather, you're going to over approximate the, to prevent breaking the program. Um, what this leads to, though, in terms of uh, the, the issues with CFI is that the precision of the control flow graph analysis actually determines the security of a CFI policy. So ideally, we'd like every edge in the control flow graph to be unique um, so that you can't sort of arbitrarily redirect control or bin control flow within your CFI policy. So as an example of this, um, we can have some sort of static analysis that's flow and context sensitive where we can recover completely the intended control flow targets at a particular point. However, this requires uh, many CFI checks uh, at that instrumentation point and basically is going to degrade performance overall. So as an optimization step or a concession, we merge these labels, in this case four and five, from um, node B so that we have a single label and we reduce the number of checks we have to uh, perform after each, before each control flow transfer. I mean, ultimately, this is going to, uh, this is an instance of where the CFG provision, precision reduces the security. Because, because an attacker can um, re redirect control flow to labels where the, the merging has occurred. In this case, I can redirect control if I find some vulnerability within node C to node D, or just back to node C again to comp uh, to perform some loop operation in my code reuse attack. Um, what we found is that a dynamic points to analysis actually kind of resolves this issue. And what that effectively is, is an estimate of the number of runtime branches that can be referenced at a particular indirect branch site during runtime. And the method is we just insert an indirect callback, a callback at the indirect branch target site to a routine that tries to match uh, its points to set. And if we find a match, then we sort of count that as um, a, a reference within the valid points to set. And we found that basically during runtime, 90% of the dynamic points to sets were singletons. So the over approximation and static analysis can be reduced to unique branches if you incorporate a dynamic runtime, I mean a dynamic points to analysis into your control flow graph construction. Uh, of course, this is limited by the execution path coverage, right? 
So it's not, it's sort of undecidable that a program will halt. And so it's, we can't be guaranteed that we'll, um, we'll cover the entire uh, execution trace of the program. But given this, we can sort of recover more CFG precision overall and prevent this sort of style of control flow bending within the policy itself. So ultimately what we're doing is we're protecting certain types of instructions. And we're only protecting instructions that are dereferencing memory indirectly, right? Uh, direct code pointers are not something that we're concerned with because you can't, code pages are not writable, right? So, um, but this is an issue for instrumentation. So 15% of the branches uh, are indirect given a, in a general case, in a general execution trace of a program. Uh, the large majority of them are returns and indirect calls, uh, but there's going to be some jumps as well, which amounts to billions of executed branch instructions. And if we're going to do static instrumentation, where we have a function call, a return, or a jump, and we need to sort of instrument the, the code to do a CFI check, where what we're doing is dereferencing from the target destination, the label, and then we're doing a comparison prior to transferring control, right? that this is going to incur a significant amount of overhead, both in instruction latency and instruction size. And on average, that, degrade, that degrades performance pretty rapidly. So what we measured is that we have some average of 35% slowdown if you're doing these styles of checks across these different types of CPUs. So we have some server end CPUs and some more high performance i7 CPUs. And the performance degradation is pretty constant across them. There's also um, some other issues associated with different elements within the microarchitectural stack. So iCache pressure reduces due to this instrumentation pretty significantly. Um, and the, uh, the de degradation and memory access latency is the one that we're most concerned with, right? So dereferencing memory, right, is going to basically occupy uh, a lot of the overhead and it's going to dominate that. So in a sort of hardware-based solution, you're gonna to wanna to try and reduce that, right, by adding potentially dedicated elements, storage elements to maintain your CFI metadata uh, that is used in checking uh, your CFI policy. Uh, finally, there's uh, some other issues with label granularity that need to be uh, resolved and pose issues for a CFI policy overall. So ultimately calls to shared objects cannot be recalled. These are external objects where I'm like sort of linking in something externally when I'm compiling it. And the idea is you don't really know how to label this. You can't actually affix a label to this uh, at runtime because multiple other objects, multiple other processes are going to be trying to access this, right? So process A wants to, you know, get um, some function from libc and process B wants to get the same function. So how do I label those? And that's the basic issue. So the solution to this traditionally has been just to apply a single label to all of those external functions. Of course, this is not ideal because we can ultimately just redirect control to all of those labels because it's just a simple CFI check. So this is an example of sort of some concession you have to make based on some limitation in the control flow graph analysis coverage that some dynamic points to analysis uh, can help and to recover and resolve ultimately. <laughs> So these, these coarse grain CFI policies sort of amount to or reduce to uh, generic uh, abstractions on the check. So for instance, you can only return to a call preceded instruction. In this case, you know, the ret will either target these and these are all great, right? But if I jump there, then <laughs> no, nope, I, can't, I can't do that, right? And so for forward edge policy, something similar occurs. I can only target forward edges, and it will trigger a fault if I target something other than a function entry, right? So this sounds great, right? But in the long run, researchers sort of determined that there, this isn't really great. There are too many call sites available. Uh, the, the heuristics associated with um, like the length of the number of returns executed prior to executing a system call or um, uh, too many indirect jumps and calls all basically provide wiggle room for me to sort of bend the control flow within these policies and around these policies. Uh, and there's been a significant amount of work done demonstrating this. And the list goes on. I basically just highlighted the ones that I think are the most interesting. Um, so, for instance, COOP is incredibly difficult to solve. As in, in general, no CFI defense, not even... Um, 
uh, LLVM's VTable verification, which does very, very fine grain uh, class hierarchy distinctions between virtual table function calls, can't handle coop. So this is like one issue that still is sort of open for research. So um, and a, as a final thing that we need to sort of think about um, when we're talking about uh, labeling is uh, returns. So these are notoriously difficult to manage because you could have two functions targeting a single call site. And my control flow graph analysis is basically going to recover um, this sort of label one and label two, right, as its points to set, okay? Now, imagine that I make a call from function A and then redirect to, to um, back to B. This is valid within my control flow integrity policy because the points to set is actually, label two is valid within this set. So, um, this basically allows granularity in your return address protection. And a shadow stack actually solves this, right? A shadow stack tightly couples call return pairs. Basically, it guarantees that you'll only return to your most recent call site, okay? Um, but this, unfortunately, incurs some sort of overhead. Um, so while ideally, I would like to implement a, a shadow stack policy, you're gonna have to address some issues with memory hierarchy, latency, and bandwidth, and sort of nested function calls. So just some basic analysis in some generic environment, we've done some um, analysis with uh, the memory hierarchy bottlenecks and sort of read latency is kind of stable and it's not very high, right? And if you tune read latency, then you can, incur you can get uh, a significant improvement in the overhead for your shadow stack implementation, uh, but you'd have to do that custom, right? And we wanna sort of avoid Nobody wants to sort of go in and tune every sort of program they've ever written. What about libc? What about, you know, this is, it's too much. Um, and you can see here that, that the degradation in performance, which is the red line, sort of drops off significantly at around 20 nested function calls. Uh, and so this is a typical sort of behavior that's going to affect your shadow stack overall. Um, surprisingly though, uh, these these two works right here, these two, I need to include these two pieces of research because they're great, is they actually say that traditional shadow stacks only incur 12% overhead. So there are optimizations that you can make to reduce what we've shown here. And uh, LLVM safe stack, which is a new protection, it's just being incorporated into the LLVM stream, uh, actually only incurs a 0.1% overhead. Uh, unfortunately, uh, despite the uh, reduction in overhead, they've done that at the cost of security. And so our collaborators, who unfortunately couldn't be here to speak about this topic, have um, investigated this and found that you can in fact break uh, CFI implementations that are using shadow software shadow stacks. And one of the reasons for this is that they optimize uh, compiler critical CFI pointers that are spilled onto the stack. And they're able to use an overwrite to corrupt that spilled pointer. At which point when the um, CFI checking mechanism uh, go, uh, starts to work, it doesn't realize that there's a malicious CFI pointer in the, in the stack. So this is actually shown to bypass this uh, IFCC uh, VTable verification implementation for safe stack. And as, um, so given that we have the, the sort of overview is that we have these forward edge policies that are really great now for CFI. Um, we have Google's VTV and IFCC, Safe Dispatch, uh, which can really, really uh, generate some fine-grained CFI policies for uh, C++ applications. And the assumption is that the backward edge CFI through safe, through shadow stack protection will completely solve this issue, right? We don't really have to think about control flow hijacking anymore. We just, we just use VTV in combination with some uh, software shadow stack, like for instance, uh, LLVM Clang, except Tomorrow, um, you're going to hear a talk, and I recommend you all go there, uh, where um, some researchers, uh, Anes Goktas and Herbert Boss, I think from VU Stack, will be presenting a bypass of playing safe stack. So what this sort of shows is that it's like sort of the, the, the underlying assumptions behind software, software shadow stacks and being able to main, maintain isolation within the software stack is going to be problematic overall. We want to kind of address that issue. Um, so with that background information and sort of the motivation details, we're gonna try and introduce at a base level what the, our implementation actually is. 
Uh, we call it Hayfix++. It was presented at DAC in 2016. We also presented a prior work in DAC in 2015, uh, which, which called Hayfix and won the best paper there. Um, it was with our collaborators here. Um, and the outcomes of that are that we have some really stateful policy agnostic uh, CFI implementation for both backward and forward, forward edges. Uh, we've created some implementation that doesn't require source code modifications to instrument uh, your application or to recover a CFG. Uh, we have a precise CFI policy enforcement for both forward and backward edges with no heuristics incorporated and we try to limit the amount of concessions and we'll sort of go over what those concessions are but we think those are good anyway. Um, we also have some isolated memory for CFI uh, metadata. It turns out that when, it, when we actually incorporate the entire system it incurs less than 3% overhead which it, on, as a worst case. Uh, which is pretty good um, in our in our um, estimation, and it supports multitasking and shared libraries, so it's practical and can scale to complex software. We also have a mechanism for interoperability with legacy code, uh, which is kind of important because not everything that you're executing on your system is going to be um, uh, instrumented with CFI protection. So at a high level, the state model has an initialization phase which is in an idle state and is checking for a CFI disabled bit. If we have CFI enabled, then we just enter CFI execution and move forward. Uh, for our forward edge control flow state model, it's again, very straightforward, uh, which is one of the benefits of our, I think our implementation is it's sort of kind of intuitive how you would implement this, is we're in a CFI execution state. If we're executing just instructions that are non-branching instructions, right? we just stay in this state, we don't need to do anything. If we encounter a call or a jump, then we need to save these call targets, right? So that later on when we actually enter the target, we can do a check, right? So upon execution of the call and jump, it's just simply, does the check work out? No, trap the program. If it does, yep, you're good to continue execution. Uh, the same thing could be said for the backward edge CFI policy, uh, which handles returns. So again, we're gonna trap uh, otherwise, we're going to continue if the label state checking matches. Uh, again, this offers uh, support for both CFI and non-CFI processes and strict enforcement of unique forward edge and backward edge control flow um, target, targets. In order to do this, we have to sort of manage the internal hardware in some way. So we choose, I chose a mechanism, which is just maintaining an internal machine register, which uh, has uh, elements for the CFI label and it can be extended into those reserved bits at the most significant bits of the uh, register. We have some interrupt service request flags for when the operating system needs to handle requests for switching tasks or overflowing or underflowing the label state stack. And we have some other sort of uh, checks and flags that enable us to moderate requests to the label state stack or the label state register to trigger errors to <laughs> stop the execution, or even to power gate the uh, CFI hardware so that you can sort of lower the energy consumption needed when there's no CFI necessary. You don't need to sort of check CFI. Uh, so uh, we've actually, we've introduced these CFI extensions to perform these tasks, these basic tasks. It requires five. Uh, we have a pre-C and a pre-J. So this sets up the call target. And then we have a separate instruction uh, CFI branch that sets up the backward edge target. Uh, we wanted to do this sort of architecturally independent and uh, not sort of perform any optimization specific to any ISA where I might be able to incorporate the CFI pre-C or pre-J into a CFI branch uh, to make it as general as possible. Um, in order to accomplish sort of execute these instructions and manipulate them, these guys sort of control the label state register and the label state stack. Uh, they, they allow separation of calls and jumps Right? So there can't be any sort of uh, funny business associated with using a jump pointer from a switch statement as a, an, a pointer from a, a call. And it allows unique labels per targets. And, and the shadow stack enables returns to only the most recently issued call site. So just as a quick overview, and I'll kind of try to breeze through this, we're going to set up the uh, label state using a CFI BR instruction by pushing a label onto the shadow stack. Uh, we're then going to push the label for the return target into a register. This register is dedicated hardware, so we don't have to do any memory dereference instructions. We can sort of access this in single cycle latencies and sort of 
uh, take advantage of modern out of order execution and register renaming to, to handle this situation as quickly as possible. Um, once we enter the target, we're going to perform a CFI label check with what's currently at the label state register for a forward edge. Um, once we then execute, uh, if that check passes, then we're going to enter the function and we're going to uh, get to a point where we need to execute a return. So that's when the return policy bring, comes into place. The return policy is simply going to look at the most recently pushed uh, label at the top of the stack. So we tightly couple the call and return pairs and this sort of grows down, right, as you would imagine it would. And it's very intuitive, the idea, right? Um, I make a call from A to B. I make a call from B to C, I can't return from C to A, right, in this implementation, right? So the shadow stack tightly couples these and enforces that I'm only returning to the most, re to the most recent call site. Um, one other thing we have to take care of is sort of interfacing with the hardware. In order to do that, we have to sort of map um, a label state stack status register to I.O. And this sort of needs to, this needs to contain information for the operating system to handle the bounds for the shadow stack size, the current pointer of the shadow stack, and to manage some sort of interrupt request uh, routines uh, that we sort of, we found down the line if we need to context switch during an underflow or underflow. This could be impl implemented as a machine uh, specific register so that you don't have to do CPU bus accesses and you can ensure only privilege access to that instruction uh, just in our our case we didn't do that um, so to answer why sort of you need hardware for CFI I think we try to show that in terms of efficiency you can get improved runtime overhead with dedicated label register and shadow stack um, due to the instruction instrumentation we have limited eye crash pressure because we're emitting less code and using hard dedicated hardware elements and register moves uh, so we could uh, eliminate that sort of uh, degradation and performance overall. We also have reduced decache pressure because we're not setting up some CFI metadata in the uh, program's data space. We have a uh, dedicated uh, label state stack and uh, that, that sort of avoids referencing from decache. And the instructions that we instrument are, uh, that we've introduced are actually single cycle instructions. All we do is we, simple, we simply toggle the functional units so that they execute as no operation instructions. And then the CFI hardware sort of manages their operations uh, separate from the out of order functional unit. And uh, as from a security perspective, we are sort of eliminating a significant number of policy concessions due to uh, the possibility of pointer aliasing analysis and the associated labeling issues. Uh, we, have, we do this with a um, point, runtime points to analysis. We have some isolated memory, which prevents these software shadow stack attacks, like stack defiler represented. I'm not exactly sure of the details for the talk tomorrow, but potentially it prevents that as well. And we have this precise policy enforcement that is agnostic with respect to the labeling mechanism. So, if I want to label all of the, um, uh, if I want to label all of the uh, code in my um, CFI protected program with the same label, then I have just a basic single equivalence class CFI policy. And I could upgrade that or downgrade that, you know, per use. With that being said, I'm going to sort of introduce uh, Orlando and he'll finish up the talk for us. Right. So we have this very nice piece of hardware that uh, Dean here introduced for us. Um, unfortunately, we need to control this guy somehow. We have to run this on top of an operating system. We have the problem that modern operating systems are actually multitasking systems and we only have one CFI module. We have multiple processes though. And plus we have legacy code, you know, that program you got back in the year 2000 that your business really needs and you can't really replace. So we have a few challenges ahead of us. We need to be able to share this CFI subsystem across multiple processes. We need to keep a separation of processes as well. We need to keep the CFI state for each process independent from each other. We need to be able to handle whatever exceptions the uh, CFI module um, exposes to us. Plus, again, legacy code, big elephant in the room there. Um, so we have to make a few changes to uh, the way programs run on your uh, computer. Um, so we have a scheduling issue, first of all, have a process that's currently running the CPU, and suddenly a new process is being scheduled, comes in, it has its own CFI states. We need to be able to handle this thing somehow. There is a second case that happens, 
you have one process running, second process comes in, it also has, it doesn't have any CFI state, it's not CFI instrumented. So we have to handle somehow what, the, um, what to do here. Then we have a problem with the uh, shadow stack as well, the label shadow stack. Um, turns out space is limited and we have this thing on die built into the CPU. So we do a function call or the uh, program does a function call, does another function call and another function call and another function call and we still have no returns and then we do another function call and we have a problem, we have no more space there. So we run out of shadow uh, of sex space. So what do we do here? Well, you could say, yeah, sure, why not? Just get some metrics, uh, see how big you need to make that shadow stack and see what happens. Well, unfortunately, that's not very scalable. Uh, you can't really make these large memories, put them inside a CPU. Plus, uh, you can't also get a whole bunch of programs and say, yeah, my worst case scenario in this set was this. So I'm just gonna build it like that. Um, then there's also the thing that if you need to empty this area inside the CPU, it takes time as well. So if you're copying that in kernel space, you can see, you're gonna see something like that there. Um, if for some reason you feel like you need to empty that shadow stack and uh, put something else in that place, it's gonna take time. If you do this during scheduling, well, your scheduler is now a lot slower. You don't want your scheduler to eat up CPU time that much. So that being said, let's talk some preliminaries here. First of all, a process control block. This is a standard, standard data structure in pretty much every single modern operating system. It's how the uh, operating system kernel sees your processes. If you're working in Linux, you can look in that file in there for task, uh, task structs. Uh, this takes about 1.7 kilobytes in a 32-bit system um, on Linux. And well, the process control block contains some information about the process, namely its execution state, whether we're running, where a zombie process, we're suspended, waiting for I.O., stuff like that. We contain, uh, it also contains all the uh, memory allocations that the process, uh, process has made, uh, who owns the process, the group of the process, important, the process ID as well, I.O. status information, and well, we also have the CPU context states. We built our CFI module on the CPU, so let's look at that guy and see what we have there. On a modern system like x 64 you have your inter razor file, which gets backed up in there every time you do um, a, a scale any task. In, uh, in the Leon 3 processor, which is what we used for implementation, you have a couple more razors that you have to take care of. You have some floating point registers, you have CPU status registers, and well, since we're putting stuff in there, might as well put in all CFI information for the process in the CPU context state as well. So we extend that guy and every time we do, um, we do a task switch or something happens with CFI module, we go ahead and modify the kernel to handle that for us. So adding to the scheduler then, we need to see whether our current process is CFI aware or not. If it is, we want to back up uh, the uh, CFI state into uh, the uh, process control block. And the next process that we're about to execute, we check and see um, whether or not uh, CFI aware. If it is, well, just restore the CFI state, otherwise just disable the CFI module. That being said, have some animations here for that. Process one is currently running, process two is about to be scheduled, so we see that it's CF process one is CFI aware. We get its CFI state push it into, uh, into the process control block. We check process two, see that it's CFI aware. Well, just go ahead and restore that CFI state. And now we're free to keep running process two as if nothing ever happened to it. On the second case, well, we have uh, process one running. We see that it's CFI aware. We are about to schedule process two. So we back up process one um, CFI state. We go to process two now we see that it's not CFI aware, so we just go ahead and disable that CFI module. We can go ahead and begin executing process two now, and no exceptions will occur at that point. However, there's still the stack, um, the stack issue. We already used the uh, process control block for this thing, so we might as well utilize for this as well. On overflow, you just copy a portion of that shadow stack into the process control block, um, 
go ahead and move, you move the top portion of the shadow stack to the bottom. You can do this with a flash copy on hardware. And then you set that little shadow stack uh, pointer to the, its new location. The underflow process is effectively the same thing in reverse. Got something from the process control block and put it back into the, uh, into the shadow stack. And then again, set the uh, shadow stack uh, pointer to the new location. So in an animation there, you can see, go ahead and uh, uh, get the bottom portion, put it on the CFI context on the uh, portion of the process control block, then you do your flash copy and execution continues as normal. Now, lastly, we need to investigate our CFI faults. There is a control flow violation occurring. Well, the subsystem detects it. Um, right now, we just go ahead and add a, um, an entry on the kernel logs, and then we send SQL to the process. If you're familiar with the uh, Unix um, way of signal handling, SQL cannot be caught by user land at any point. So we terminate the process. Technically speaking, we could go ahead and, um, and uh, set, uh, send any other signal we want uh, and uh, take actions based on that. There's a few little miscellaneous steps as well that we need to talk about. So you need to have these instructions in your, com in your program. So get an instrumenting compiler. Your assembler, of course, needs to be able to recognize this, these instructions as well. So we extend an assembler. Any, C, any assembly code that's in your runtime needs to be patched to include these instructions as well, otherwise the CFI subsystem will detect control flow violations unnecessarily. And well, then we go ahead and compile some stuff. And when you do that, you're gonna see that. So on average, one to 2% uh, performance overhead. And well, relative to the um, number of calls and um, indirect jumps that you have on your binary, you're going to see um, a size increase on your resulting binaries. In our testing, we saw about 13% uh, or so. Now, there have been other guys that have attempted to do this before us as well, so we should give them credit for their work as well. We have Prito et al. in 2006 with architectural support for CFI. However, they only give us a, for, um, a, a coarse grain backward edge uh, return policy. Land here gives you also a coarse grain forward and backward edge uh, policy for CFI as well. This is actually kind of good, but it can be sadly bypassed. Uh, we have also HCFI, which won Best Paper Award this year as well. It provides a fine grain of forward and backward dash support, but it only does it on single threaded embedded systems. So you don't have multitasking, you don't have uh, an operating system behind this thing, you don't have shared libraries. And uh, this year as well, Intel uh, released uh, the control, um, uh, their own control uh, flow policy extension for their CPUs. They apparently have been working on this for quite a bit now. They have a built-in hardware uh, shadow stack as well. They add a new racer for this, the shadow stack pointer. They add a couple of instructions to manipulate this shadow stack pointer as well. Um, however, um, it suffers a bit when it comes to forward edges. Um, any indirect jumps or calls in uh, Intel's uh, CFI, they can target any branch end instruction. There is really, uh, there's a coarse grain policy there, so Comparing our approach to the other guys, well, ACFI has some very nice performance overhead. Um, however, they use the uh, Leon 3 processor uh, implements, implementing the Spark uh, version 8 instruction sets. And uh, they use some very um, architecture-specific optimizations, like putting things on the uh, pipeline bubble on branch, on branch instructions, instructions and things like that. And well, Intel said the other major implementation um, any call or jump instruction can target any end branch instruction that makes it rather weak for a sophisticated attacker. Um, that being said, that's all we got, guys. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. What's the response of the chip manufacturers? Are they likely to implement this? Uh, pardon? Are the chip manufacturers likely to implement this? So, um, like we said at the back end of the talk, is that Intel is actually uh, pursuing this, and they're interested in doing the c control flow enforcement technology for shadow stacks. One of the issues is uh, a shadow stack, uh, a hardware shadow stack, sort of guarantees this really fine grain backward edge CFI policy, and an open issue is a forward edge mechanism. Uh, I think that 
when it is released and uh, produced that potentially you know other manufacturers will jump on board considering that these sort of ROP style attacks are still prevalent and sort of shouldn't be right because there are solutions that can prevent them. And so basically it's a hardware uh, module and you need to change the compiler right to use this instruction. So what about I mean tail call optimization in that case you will just have a return instruction that's like uh, don't check it. So in the case of a tail call optimization, this is one of the uh, those uh, nice corner cases that we came across. Um, you effectively have a jump to uh, where you will normally have a call, which means that instead of just going and pushing a value on your on your uh, it's on your regular stack and shadow stack, you just go directly to a new location. Well, the backward dash is actually check on the original caller. So you call from A to B, but then from B you jump into C. The check actually happens back in A, so we don't really see that issue there. When we do the jump from B to C, we never see that backward edge. We have to return back into B there. Okay, but the compiler cannot produce any weird code. So we we actually we actually never saw the compiler introducing any weird shenanigans in there since we uh, we tightly coupled um, our CFI checks to uh, to explicitly to calls. When the compiler sees a little optimization it can make it can make there, it eliminates the call. It also eliminates um, any possible checks that we will introduce at that point for backward edges. Uh, so we basically, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and also how do you get the, uh, yeah, okay, okay, it's fine. Uh, which architecture do you use? <laughs> yeah. uh, so we have both implementations for the Spark, Spark V8 and for x86 slash 64. Um, but this, sorry, this is an, an instructional stack architecture extension, right? So it means these, is, these are new instructions. Mm -hmm. How are you able to benchmark on the x 64 So we run it in a cycle accurate emulator. Uh, we oh, use the, okay. yeah, so basically we're using a cycle accurate emulator and so the performance results are going to sort of vary with respect to actual hardware, right? But in general, there's a long lineage of using emulators and sort of getting semi-reliable results, right? Within, of course, a percent error, right? Okay. Good? Yeah, that's fine. What was your second question? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I think the time is. I think the time is. Okay. So, no other Thank questions? You. Yeah, thanks yeah. for attending the talk, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>